An evangelist in Brisbane once taught me the question to ask is not, have you received Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, but do you love Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? I sat there as a young Christian in a congregation in the Windsor Road Baptist Church pondering that question as he went through the first letter to the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation. And um, that's who we are, isn't it? Primarily lovers of Jesus Christ. And if you want to ask preachers, well, what are you? Well, I don't know. I can't find good expressions that are meaningful to people in the, the, the wider world. But maybe this is something for all of us. Maybe being part of the keynotes here on Sunday night, you would call yourself a Jesusologist. <laughs> you want to study Jesus because you love him. And uh, I think... On that note, we probably should introduce our reading tonight. So if you have a Bible nearby, or you can look on a friendly neighbour there, you might want to turn to the book of Philippians, to the first chapter. Something has happened to my display here. Yes, it's here. And you might also want to turn to 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 9 as well. So Philippians, chapter 1 is where the main reading comes from. And perhaps, although we're only going to focus on part of it or some themes in it, perhaps we should start around about verse 3 to get the joy and the prayer of it. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until, mark this phrase, the day of Christ Jesus. We'll come back to that phrase, the day of Christ, mentioned many times. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in my defence and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, that's verse 13, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. And the latter do it out of love, knowing I'm, I'm appointed for the defence of the gospel. And the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. But what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn out for my mark this word, deliverance or salvation, soteria it is, through your prayers and through the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope that I shall not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by my life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in this flesh, 
This will mean fruitful labour for me, and I do not know which to choose, but I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. And convinced of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Amen. That other verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, is kind of like a, a banner verse over any study of what we, what we call the day of Christ, the time when Christ returns for us, and that intermediate state that we might have with him when we go to be with him that Paul is wrestling with here. Look at what it says there. Just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. How much has he prepared for you? How much? I still remember sitting around the dining room table when I was just about to become engaged to Chris, my wife, and the pastor's wife who lived next door in the manse came across and she said, what do you think heaven's going to be like? What a good question. What a great topic. This verse reminds me of my wife. People have been asking me lately, uh, how are you doing? How are you coping? I describe when Chris is having a bad week and um, they want to know what's, what's going on with you and why are you still smiling, at least occasionally, between the tears. And the answer is because of this teaching, there is something about joy. Christ, Paul is a Christ-intoxicated man and he enjoys Christ in this life, on the earth, serving other believers. He enjoys that, but it is so much better, he anticipates. Even if in the disembodied state, without a body, you know, dying and his, his soul being in conscious communion with Christ as the next experience within a moment of our death. Does anybody look forward to that? Because that's so much better. And of course, the day of Christ when we receive new bodies and the resurrection and so on is even better. So what have you got to look forward to? Is anybody smiling? I can't, my glasses are not good enough. <laughs> you are, you are. I'm glad that you're smiling. I want to put it to you tonight. Um, the uh, slide hopefully will appear on the screen. There it is. We're talking about intermediate joy. It's the joy between now and then. And I'm going to put it to you that the, the proper preparation for you serving Christ is our contemplating what heaven brings through the cross. A pastor once spoke of a friend named Joy. Joy was a Sunday school teacher and she worked in an underprivileged area. It was a tough area. And teacher Joy had in her class a very timid nine-year-old girl named Barbara. Barbara's home life was very difficult. It had left her afraid and insecure as a little girl. For weeks that Joy was teaching the Sunday school class, little Barbara never spoke. Never. Not once. Other children talked, she sat. Others sang, she was silent. Others giggled, she was quiet and restrained. Always present, always listening, taking things in, always speechless though, never said a word. Until the day that teacher Joy taught her Sunday school class on heaven. So if you're a Sunday school teacher, good topic. She talked about seeing God. Fancy phrase, the beatific vision, you know, the joy of seeing Christ. 
text. She talked about tearless eyes. She talked about deathless lives. Life restored. And little Barbara was fascinated by this. Clearly, she was listening. She wouldn't stop staring up at Teacher Joy. She listened with hunger, and then she raised her hand, and she said, Mrs. Joy, and Teacher Joy was stunned, because Barbara had never asked a question. Yes, Barbara, is heaven for girls like me? You know, when you teach about what Christ has done and how Christ is coming, it awakens inconsolable longing in the human heart. There are questions that just beg for answers. They're moved within us by the convicting and the drawing work of the Holy Spirit of Christ, who loves to put the spotlight on Jesus, doesn't he? And in the midst of all of your heartaches tonight and all your heart longings, does being with the Lord Jesus just seem too good to be true, too good to spend much time thinking about? You know, I'm only four foot 11 and I'm going to heaven and it makes me feel 10 feet tall. Do you remember those lyrics of the song sung by, what was her name? Evie Tornquist, wasn't it? And of course, I think she may have gone there already. Um, but what about you? My question to you tonight is not just, are you an avid believer in the theory about heaven? My question is, are you excitedly going to heaven with Evie and do you have some certain biblical idea of what that hope would look like in your future? How does it play out? Do you know with certainty and clarity that brings joy to you the way it did to Paul? What difference does knowing that certainty and the nature of that hope, what difference does it make to the way that you live, to the way that you serve or the way that you persevere in tough circumstances? That solid hope, that's what the word elpis means in the New Testament, it's, it's, a, it's a solid hope. It's not a vague hope. It's a very solid, specific, concrete thing. It makes enormous difference. It did in the teacher joy. It gave her that hope that inspired something in that little girl, Barbara. It's the sort of clear hope that enables our witness. And it's the same kind of hope that makes an enormous difference to the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. And because of that hope, even in Paul's circumstances, he has a fair bit to tell us in Philippians 1 about what he calls salvation. Now, it might be in your Bible, deliverance. But the original word is soteria. Salvation? Deliverance? Paul noted that preachers, whatever their motives, some good, some bad, were speaking about salvation at least. And so Paul says in verse 18, it's because of that, because it's being proclaimed, he says, in this I, I rejoice and I will continue to do so. It's, he says, and I will rejoice. I will yet rejoice, in other words. And why will Paul rejoice and continue to rejoice about this future salvation? Well, because of what he says in the next verse. See verse 19 in your Bible? He talks about how he knows that this is all going to turn out for his deliverance or his salvation. And he says that it's through your prayers. And he says it's through the support or the provision or the supply, it could be different in your translation, of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Through those two things. It's important to notice, first of all, that Paul didn't think that anything much was going to happen for him in his life and ministry without their prayers. That's important, isn't it? Paul placed incredible value upon the combined prayer of the saints. It even makes a difference, humanly speaking, to the coming of Christ. We can hasten the day of his coming, even though he foresees everything, he listens to us. Paul placed great value on prayer. He was an apostle, but he felt that he just could not do without the prayer of these people. They were his, you could say, his closest allies. He valued Lydia's prayers and the prayers of her household. He valued the jailer's prayer and his household. He desired the prayers of Euodia and Syntyche, even though they weren't getting along so well. 
He wanted the prayer of Clement and the other people that are mentioned. And most of them were people of no great standing, no great social standing, yet Paul valued their supplications and he was grateful for their prayers, as grateful for their prayers as he was for the physical monetary gifts that he received from them. He seems to have earnestly desired to be prayed for and he had confidence that they really were praying for him there. Maybe Epaphroditus, who's associated with the the travels and exchanges, maybe he'd given Paul news about them praying for him. So Paul does not so much ask for their prayers just here as he reckons upon the effectiveness of their prayers that he, he senses he's already receiving. You know, all pastors worth their salt, and I'm saying this because it's last month was not only missionary month, it was pastoral appreciation month, Jim, Pastor Jim. And all pastors, including Jim, all the good ones, without exception, earnestly desire the perpetual prayers of those under their care. Are you praying for your pastors and your mentors and disciples in the faith? Charles Spurgeon said this, and I think it's worth putting on the screen. He looked for the transformation, this is Paul, he looked for the transformation of good, of evil into good, by that sacred alchemy of heaven that can transmute the basest metal into pure as gold. But he did not expect this to happen apart from the ordained methods and ordinary institutions of grace. He's speaking about prayer. And he counted upon the result because he saw two great agents At work, these agencies, prayer and the supply of the Spirit. You'll see that in the King James Version, the supply. Whoever else may be foolish enough to look for effects apart from causes, the apostle was not of their mind. So he's thinking about the second coming, he's thinking about the day of Christ. Don't think that means there's no place for prayer. (laughs) There absolutely is. So it's also important that Paul recognised the mysterious, pervasive influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, if we were studying 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Jim would be pointing out to us the role that the Spirit plays and doesn't play during the period of tribulation. But the pervasive influence of the Spirit pierces the Apostle Paul's experiences. He's very conscious of how dependent he is on prayer and the supply of the Spirit. You see those words? In verse 19 at the end there, the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of Christ, what does that mean? He's the anointed one. He's the saviour, prophet, priest, king, the special one, the unique one, the saviour. And just as Jesus was helped by the spirit in the days of his earthly ministry, so Paul sees the spirit as helping him in his ministry. Enabling him to do and be the kind of person that he needed to be, even if he died. So he sees this supernatural help from these two things as being richly provided for him, and especially at the end, by the Holy Spirit. Now, for those of you who are keen supporters of the King James Version, or the New King James Version, that word that's translated supply, That word, put it on the screen, epikoragia. It means, in some translations, that it's translated provision or help. And it was used for the kind of care a husband should give to his wife. It's used of the focused role of a ligament in the human body. And it's used to describe the chorus. You know in those famous Greek plays, the Greek dramas? The chorus was a little group of people who'd come out and say various poetical and sing various poetical things which would add meaning and direction to the whole play and give direction to it. The whole term relates to the idea of getting strength that enables you or purposeful direction that helps you function. So the emphasis is it's dynamic, it's purposeful, and because of that kind of intention to use in an English translation the word help is a bit weak. If if you're forced to have a single word translated, I don't think you could come up with a better one than the King James Version, which is the word supply. But even so, it's hard to get the whole meaning in a single English word. The The whole idea in verse 19 
is that Paul, as a Christ believer, is receiving structured support. He's getting purposeful empowerment. He's getting both guidance and strength. And he wants us to do the same thing. He's speaking here in verse 19 about what the Spirit does to oversee and support and bring about God's outcomes in our lives. And he wants us to be firmly hoping in heaven. He wants us to understand this, to receive a joy that lifts us up in the midst of our heartaches. And Paul had a lot of heartaches. His circumstances were not easy. Now, it's important to see what Paul calls the supply of the Spirit. For those of you who studied grammar at school, do you remember your days of studying English grammar, perhaps? There's two different kinds of genitive of the Spirit, what can that mean? It can mean that the spirit is the subject of the action or it can mean it's the object of the action. So this is not an objective genitive. It's not an affinitive genitive, which would imply that it's the spirit himself who is what helps Paul. No. Instead, this is a subjective genitive. That's the spirit doing the helping. It's the subject of the verb. He is doing the supplying. The Spirit is the one who's supplying something to Paul, empowering something within Paul, despite the daunting circumstances that Paul's in. One preacher puts it this way. The spirit would come alongside of Paul in all the tangle-threatening circumstances of his life and provide strength for every eventuality. And I put it to you, the hope of heaven is an important part of this. If you want to see God's strength and direction at your life, in your life, you should remember the important balance that we read in the next chapter, in Philippians 2, you might want to turn to it just to get the Pauline picture on this. He's not saying it's all God doing this for him. He's not saying this is something he achieves in his own strength of character. He's not saying either of those two things. Look at what it says on the screen there. Do you see the words that are bolded out? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do you see the balance there? That's the New King James. The Spirit would enable Paul to will, that is to resolutely desire something. The Spirit would enable Paul to do, that is, it would enable him to perform what is God's good pleasure in situation after situation in his life. But that doesn't mean that the Spirit would just do those things instead of Paul himself needing to act. Back in Philippians 1 verse 19, back in chapter 1, just what does Paul see as being provided by the Spirit's help and brought in by means of the church's prayers for him? And the answer is, it's what he calls my deliverance, my salvation, my soteria, a great deal of perspiration has been spilt on that verse. A lot of blood and ink have gone into discussing it. There's a lot of debate about what particular deliverance is he thinking of. It's clear that it's not just his past salvation in, in the sense of he's justified by faith in Christ and he's delivered from aspects of God's judgment in that kind of sense that's already passed. It's not talking about past. It's talking about something future. It's a deliverance that's in the future, but what kind of deliverance did he mean? Well, <clears> the <throat> best thing I could do is try to sum up what all the brainiacs said, and I'll briefly flash what they say on the screen, and you can look at it, and you can decide whether you believe them or not. Here's what the Journal of Biblical Literature says. It talks about that salvation, that deliverance that he speaks of in verse 19, has sometimes been understood as his expectation of release, deliverance from prison, physically. Although it is clear that Paul does anticipate release, look at the other verses there later in the chapter, his use of deliverance here probably refers to something more transcendent, such as ultimate vindication or salvation in the distant end of history. Maybe. Among the reasons for this is Paul's hope expressed in verse 20 that Christ will be exalted in his body whether by life or by death. So if this being exalted or delivered is independent of his life or death, 
It cannot primarily refer to his escaping from danger in jail. That's a pretty good argument. It goes on. It even contemplates that Paul is considering suicide here because it's so good to be in heaven. I don't think that's the case, mind you. And it points out that in verse 19, this little phrase you see on the screen, this to me will become unto salvation. See that phrase? It's in Greek letters there. This will turn out for my deliverance. It's a rough English translation. Do you know that it's lifted straight out of the book of Job? Isn't that interesting? Word for word. Too much of a coincidence. I think it's a quotation from the Septuagint translation of the book of Job into Greek. If Paul understands his experience as in some way parallel to Job's experience, he apparently assumes the role of the righteous sufferer. Job's the pattern. He's got a whole lot of preachers giving him a hard time in chapter 2 and 3. Do you remember the, the situation? And, 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 and at that part of Job, it's referring back to his pious, his supposedly godly preacher friends who are wrongly preaching at him. So is that the kind of deliverance? Is it, is it justification before human critics? He's surrounded by critics who are unhappy with him. Some of them are trying to make him jealous as he's in jail. What a lovely Christian friend that would be. Anyway, the last slide says, whilst Paul's diction derives from scripture, from the book of Job, his joy is grounded in the community's prayer, the spirit's provision, and his big word, his end time hope. They're the themes that we're looking at tonight. Have you come across that term before, eschatology? You've defined it for, it, for them, haven't you? Jim. Eschatos, meaning the end, and logos, the word that's the suffix on the end, meaning like a disciplined study of something. And uh, that's what we're doing here on Sunday nights, isn't it? That's what Jim's doing next week as he returns to the prophet Daniel. It has to do with last things, the things that happen at the end of time, the end of human history, where God intervenes. And it also refers to the way that God intervenes in our life, at the end of our life, where he translates us into the very presence of Christ until we are brought with him again, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, those who died in Christ, the disembodied persons who are with him in heaven right now, maybe us soon, are brought with him to that great day where they receive their resurrection bodies first and the believers who are alive at the time, maybe that will be us next week, who knows? But we will be re both receiving our resurrection bodies and we'll not only be with Christ, we'll be with Christ with a resurrection body. How much doubly better is that? This New Testament word, eschaton, the end or last things, is just a wonderful topic to build our hope. And in Philippians chapter 1, he speaks twice, Paul, of our blessed hope. He anticipates this by speaking about the day of Christ. Now, who knows what the day of Christ means? Interesting topic. It speaks of an end time, physical seeing of Christ, face to face when Jesus Christ gladly receives resurrected believers to himself in the air and we can discover this from studying the way this phrase is used in the New Testament in the wider context it's not only mentioned twice in chapter 1 it's also mentioned in chapter 2 verse 16 there is half the references to the day of Christ in the New Testament just in the first two chapters of the letter to the Philippians the other three are elsewhere in Corinthians so what is the day of Christ? He's really interested in this and he's clearly persuaded that his first readers are a work in progress and that progress is going to continue, the Holy Spirit's going to help them continue to grow until the day of Christ. Now, there's two ways that can happen. You can live until Christ comes for his saints in the air or you can live until you die and you're transported into the throne room of heaven. Do you see how... What happens to you even as you die is part of the eschatology of the Bible. He will perfect you, he might say, until the day of Christ Jesus. 
And to help us understand how the Spirit completes this work in us, we have to begin to recognize that the Bible distinguishes between various days, various prophetic days. In the Bible, we're often described as living in man's day. Does that sound good? Hmm. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 3 is translated in different ways, but it, it, it's not about man's judgment. Literally, it means man's day in which man is exalting himself now, judging others. God seems to remain silent. That's man's day. But by contrast to that, mentioned six times in the New Testament, there's Christ's day. And it explicitly has to have the word Christ or Messiah in it. The day of Christ, the day of Christ Jesus. And that's mentioned also in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 8. And I think I put the references in your notes there. And it's also in not only chapter 1 and chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 as well. So six references to it. Now, there's another expression that you will be very familiar with. The day of the Lord, right? In your Old Testament, so you'll often have... Lord with capital letters, the day of Yahweh, the day of Jehovah, the day of God. Not explicitly the day of the Messiah, but the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh. That's a common expression. It's a different expression. We can spend more time on, on another occasion, perhaps. That's the day or the time period of God's intervention in judgment. That's the essential thing that's always mentioned when that expression is used. Sometimes it's a judgment that anticipates the great judgment at the end of history. It's a day of the Lord anticipating the great day, but it's always a day of judgment. Not necessarily a pleasant experience, you might say. And by contrast, the day of Christ is especially the day or the time period when Christ will come and receive believers and we'll see him face to face. We'll see the Saviour face to face that's the beautiful aspect of that day. They might refer to similar time periods. It's not so much about the chronology, it's about the experience that you have. The circumstance of how this hope comes to us is described in a number of passages. How does that hope come to us? In my father's house. Do you remember that expression? In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places, said Jesus. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. It's not necessarily the long-term place, but it's, it's a place for you. I'll be with you. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's one of the reasons why pastors like Jim and myself and others believe that when we are taken to see Christ, it's not primarily to instantaneously turn around about face and return with the Lord in judgment. Because we're encouraged that we're going to spend some time with him. You're looking forward to that. And there's a number of things in scripture that indicate things like the judgment of believers' works, the reward, the white clothes, the marriage supper of the Lamb, all these sorts of things I think will happen before we're involved in Christ's return to the earth later on. A topic for another talk, perhaps. Or well, what about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Remember when Paul said, I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren. I want you to know about those who've fallen asleep. And that's a metaphorical way of describing how our bodies appear when we die. When they die like this, I don't want you to be uninformed. And he says, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. This is what gives us hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. You can't talk about the day of Christ without anticipating the fact that believers, when we die, we go into the immediate presence of who? Christ. Straight away, you're a heart beat away from heaven if you're Christ's tonight. If you're not, you're in a very different place. And we could go on and we could read from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We could read from Philippians chapter 1, where we really are tonight. 
And so when we're taken to meet Christ and be continuously with Christ, we will then eventually appear at his judgment seat, we'll be rewarded. We can read about those passages in Corinthians and Romans. But this is a contrast to the day of Christ from that more general day of the Lord. And that day of the Lord, day of Yahweh, that's mentioned 16 times in the Old Testament alone and several times in the New Testament. The first time it pops up is in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12, which refers to God judging and bringing judgment to the nations. So this is the reason why pastors like myself or Pastor Jim, that's why we would tend to think of these days as being parallel, but not at exactly the same time. The fact that we can differentiate them means that they may start in slightly different ways. Who believes that we will be caught up with the other saints and be with Christ before that great time of tribulation of which Pastor has been speaking recently? Do you believe that? Well, that would make this a different time even from the day when Christ returns. They're similar times. They're not really about chronology, but they're very different experiences, aren't they? Anyway, rather than delve into all the passages where the day of the Lord is used in the New Testament, we'll just leave that for another time. So the day of the Lord, if we can sum up, is about a coming period of universal judgment and condemnation. And it's also about the consummation of the Messiah's reign, where he begins to reign justly over the nations. Sometimes we talk about the millennial reign of the Saviour. And that's part of a good experience for us, but it starts for us with the day of Christ when we see him face to face. Who longs for that? As the deer pants for the stream, O oh Lord. So we long for that. Such judgments do have to come, the ones we've been talking about, but for us, what comes first? Lovers of Jesus here, what comes first? Seeing your beloved's face. That's what comes first. That's what gives us a joy that wells up from time to time and just overwhelms all of our heartaches, distractions and griefs. It's what sustains us. It's the hope that gave Paul his compass in the difficulties of ministry. And his difficulties were much greater, I'm pleased to learn, than what I've ever faced. The expression, the day of the Lord, is similar but different. So we don't want to talk about the day of God or the day of Christ anymore in contrast. If you want to read more about that, I thought there's a little excerpt from uh, Dwight Pentecost's famous book, Things to Come There. And in fact, if you don't like reading long quotations, I'm with you. So I've had some of it highlighted so you can read just the miniature version. It's inside your notes. So if you're interested in what I'm going to say now, it's on the back page. In our passage... Especially verses 6 and 10, Paul's eye is on the day of Christ, right? And the experience that he is especially looking forward to, this joyful, comforting anticipation that he has, is the time when we, the blood-bought bride of Christ, will be caught away to be with Christ in the air and in the place that he has for us. Or it could be when we appear even earlier than that, just earlier on, at the time of our physical death, and we get a taste of what that will be like. We won't have a body, but guess who we'll be with? And that is so much better even than being in this world, said Paul. Physical death? So I'm going to just skim through all the little quotes from Dwight Pentecost because you can look at them for yourself. And I'm just going to take us back to Philippians. And, um, and I want to speak about this, this issue of being with Christ before he comes in the air. Paul's not exclusively interested in the day of us being catched up to be with Christ. He's also interested in how some of us will arrive a little earlier than that. Eschatology doesn't just concern ourselves with the catching up part. It also concerns about what happens to us in the intermediate time. We should be interested because Paul's interested in it. Look at verse 20, 21 
and 23. He's describing what happens there when we immediately die. Before the physical resurrection body is given to us. You know, talk to lots of people at funeral services and they go on talking about, oh, little Johnny is now in heaven and he's got his new legs and his new... And he, well, he hasn't got his resurrection body yet, but he is with the Lord. If he's Christ's, he is. So this part of eschatology is called the doctrine of the intermediate state. It's our condition with God immediately after our death. And for most of us, it occurs before Christ comes for the church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And at that point then, Christ comes in the air. He brings the disembodied souls of the earlier dead in Christ with him. And they get, quite fairly, says Paul, their resurrection bodies just an instant before the rest of us who've survived to that time will get our resurrection bodies. But it'll all be over very quickly. And the main thing, we'll be with the Lord. Living, believing saints. Alive. On the earth, just prior to what we believe is the notorious period of tribulation. Now look at verse 20 and 21. Look at how Paul contemplates his own physical death. He speaks about, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will always, even now as all, always, be exalted in my body, whether by my life or my death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So let me ask you a question. Do you think it's so much better to die and be with Christ? The only reason why Paul stuck around was for their sake. But that means no taking of shortcuts. In some ways, Paul welcomes death. And in other ways, he doesn't. From a ministry point of view, he doesn't. Now, most people that you know, maybe you yourself, you don't welcome death, right? Do you? Maybe even if you're in great distress, you want to avoid it. I read stories about this because people in congregations can identify with this fact. I remember reading this one uh, in 1993. It's about fishing. There's a guy near a, a glacier, his name was Bill Jiraki, and he got his leg pinned under a huge rock. And there was a forecast of snow. And he didn't have a jacket. He didn't have a backpack. He didn't have any means of communication like a mobile phone. And in a desperate attempt to survive, he used his flannelette shirt, he took off his only shirt, and he used that as a tourniquet. And then he used his fishing knife to amputate his own leg at the knee joint. Talk about going the extra mile to stay alive. He used clips from his fishing kit, he had a fishing tackle box, that's all he had, to clamp his arteries shut. I'm finding it hard to imagine, actually. Then he crab walked back to his truck and he drove himself to hospital. That's the length that some people will go to to stay alive. I'm not sure I'd go to all that trouble. Then there's another fellow, uh, 10 years later, 2003, the early noughties. I've got a series of stories. We haven't got time to listen to them. A guy called Aaron Ralston had a near-death experience too. His arm was crushed this time under a rock fall. And after six days of being trapped and unable to move, he amputated his own right forearm, his own right arm. I'm not sure how he even did that physically. He was exhausted, dehydrated. But then he rappelled down a 60-foot cliff. How do you do that with one arm? Hiked eight miles, found a Dutch family who guided him to a rescue hel uh, helicopter that took him to hospital. And he survived. What do those stories teach us? It's what your contact with ordinary people every day. It teaches you that human beings will very often do remarkable things in order to extend their physical lives. Now, some people are not so physical. They might just reform their diet. We spend enormous amounts of money on the best doctors. We take up stringently disciplined eating habits. We move to particular climates. We even cut off body parts to survive. And the deciding question that we all have to face is this. What do we live for? We don't know how long we have. 
We don't know how long we can put this question off. I ask you tonight, what do you live for? What do you really live for? Writing from a prison cell, he tells us, Paul, about our true gospel purpose in life. That's a big enough purpose for Gospel Baptist Church, isn't it? Our gospel purpose in life. He talks about his gospel purpose. Number two, he tells us about our experience of glory and vindication. He's looking forward to being vindicated. He's not going to do it himself. He's not going to play one-upmanship games with all of his critics. But he does look forward to vindication. And meanwhile, number three, he tells us that God will keep on working in us in ways that should fill us with hope until the day of Christ. Or we die in the meanwhile. And when we are complete in him, we will stand before him and we will see him face to face. The Apostle Paul tells us about a life that's worth living, a death that's worth dying. And verse 21 sums it up for us. It says, for me, living is Christ and dying is even better. It's gain, he says. Sometime in the future, make sure you consider more of this passage in terms of how living and hope And having Christ works out in serving him. Because tonight, we're just focused on the eschatology. We're focused on the hope for the future there. Let's just consider how Paul anticipates the great gain before him and any believer when that true believer in Jesus dies physically. He says it's great gain. He has something utterly precious to look forward to with his Lord. But Paul has Christ in this life as well, according to verse 21. It's got something to do in the meanwhile. And according to verse 23, when Paul speaks about this departure, which is physical death here, this other thing experienced even immediately after physical death, he says, quote, is very much better. Is that what it says in your Bible? Very much better. Keep in mind that these words come from a man of joy. He's a man of joy who's already intoxicated with the enjoyment of Christ in his ministry and life. So what comes after that earthly enjoyment that's even better than that? What's very much better? What gets the very much better label from the Apostle Paul? He's not like the Dem Tell man where everything's better. He's saving this up for something that's really, really better. You should be interested in this doctrine of the intermediate state. It fits into a big picture of the doctrine of last things. It's part of it. Why should you do that, my friends? Because you, for you, it can bring anticipatory joy. It can lift you up. There are things that I face. Look, I don't want to die a horrible physical death, do you? But death has never bothered me. There have been things I've always been more scared about than death. Paul knows about those sorts of things. You know about those things too. You know what I'm talking about. There are some things that are like (laughs) death to you. They can happen to you in this life while you're still living. And you're more scared of those than you are of dying, aren't you? That makes sense. But what should we do in light of this? This is how Paul handles it. He contemplates going into the immediate presence of Christ... He knows that he'd prefer to go there. He knows that he'd be in a disembodied state. Unclothed is the language that he uses. He doesn't think about purgatory. No purgatory for Paul. Anybody believe in purgatory here? No mention of purgatory. Straight into the presence of Christ, right? What about soul sleep that some of our friends in various groups... We used to call them cults once, but we're more politically correct. We call them friends when they have very different views of this. Soul sleep? Does Paul contemplate soul sleep? No. No. He doesn't see purgatory or soul sleep. His body might be euphemistically sleeping. It might be described in that way. But he knows that he will be alive in the presence of Jesus. Joyously alive to him. He'd already explained to the Corinthians, like on the screen in 2 Corinthians 5, that absence from your body, while it sleeps in the ground or wherever, as as you've died, our 
consciousness is in the immediate presence of the Lord. So there's no question in Paul's mind about the superiority of that experience. It's better by far. Why is it better by far? This is what you need to think about. This is, I'm, I'm stealing this from Paul, right? So I can give you good advice because it's his. Number one, why is it better by far? Because it brings us close to the goal of our Christian life. You can read chapter 3, Philippians 3, 8 to 14. You might want to write that down. That is one of the reasons why it's better by far. It's the goal of his whole Christian life. It's the goal of our Christian life. Number two, it brings us rest from our labours. Is anybody looking forward to a rest? I, I know that Jim and Susan probably need a rest times ten. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, if you want a proof text, I didn't get that one from the Apostle Paul, I stole it from the Apostle John. And thirdly, it brings us the sheer, unstinting joy of being in the immediate presence of Jesus. In fellowship with him, in the presence of the Lord Jesus, whose touch, whose attention, whose acknowledgement will be all the world to you more than all the world. That's Philippians 1 verse 23. You can extrapolate that from there. That's why this is better by far. A back to the Bible broadcaster put these words out once and I'll just read them out to you. You can read them on the screen. This is what he said. I have from scripture, from Jeremiah. I have plans for you, he, he says God could say to us. Plans to prosper you and give you a hope and a future. You have an opportunity to embrace my plans or reject them. Your future depends on which course you follow. One of two scenarios could occur in your future. If you have received by faith my plan to save you, here's what's ahead for you. It's certain that one day you'll die unless you live to the day my son comes to take his followers to heaven with him. And then we could remember that man is destined to die once, even if it's at that Dying kind of experience when we receive our resurrection body. It's going to happen. Death is universal and certain because it's the consequence of human sin, which is for everybody. Death is separation from our earthly existence. Yes. The Christian soul now immediately enters my presence, God could say to you, while the body is placed in the ground. He could remind us, said this radio broadcaster, I told Adam that as a result of his sin, by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. That's where our body sleeps. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. And that's true for all of us as Adam's descendants, isn't it? The speaker went on to say, but one day I will retrieve your body from the grave and reconstitute it as a body unlike anything you could imagine, a body suited to the atmosphere of heaven where you will live with me forever. And that's what awaits all who have faith in Jesus Christ as their saviour. What about those who refuse? Well, he wasn't bashful about telling us that. He said, if that is you, if you resist, resist that plan, brace yourself to hear what awaits the rejection of my son. You too will die someday. But what happens immediately after that death is entirely different from what I've just described. It's different from what we've been talking about tonight. He says, for you, death seals your fate. I've given people plenty of opportunities to respond to the gospel. Perhaps that's you tonight. Through Jesus Christ, there is a gospel message. But once you've taken your last breath, and you've died. All chances for salvation have passed. Upon death, those who've never accepted Jesus as their saviour will go to a place the Bible refers to as Hades. And Hades... Hades in the Greek New Testament. It's not hell, it's not Gehenna, but it might as well be because that's where one thing leads to another for a person who doesn't know Christ now. There's no returning to joy. You know, there's no coming back from Hades now. It's where the unsaved people go to await the bodily resurrection to meet their final judgment and their final banishment from everything that is good. You might say, David, it's Christmas season. You're not giving me a very cheerful message tonight. It's Advent. And some of you might think there should be like a joyous pre-Christmas message tonight. 
But in a sense, this is the season of Advent. It's always the season of Advent. Ever since the first Advent of Jesus, we've been looking forward to the second Advent of Jesus. We don't have to just celebrate that in December, do we? The end of the story is not Christ's first coming. The reason why we can celebrate Christmas as we come up to it soon is because we're looking forward to the second advent. We're looking forward especially to that aspect we call the day of Christ. Amen? A Christian author, and I finish on this, he wrote a book called Immortality. I don't endorse everything that he said, but listen to this. He said this. It's a poem. I'm standing on a seashore. A ship arrives, a ship at my side spreads her white sails to the morning breeze and starts out for the ocean blue. She's an object of beauty and strength. And that's what human life can be like. And I stand and watch her until that length she hangs like a speck of white cloud just where the sea and the sky come down to meet each other, the horizon. And then someone at my side, observing this, says, There! She's gone. Gone where? Gone from my sight, that is all. She is just as large in mast and hull and spar as she was when she left my side, and just as able to bear her load of living weights to its place of destination, her diminished size is in me, in my sight, not, not, not in her. And just at that moment when someone says, there, she's gone. On that distant shore there are other eyes watching for her coming, other voices ready to take up the glad shout, here she comes. And such, my friends, is dying, at least for the believer. We anticipate this, if we're wise, every day. All we anticipate, the imminent coming of Christ, the day of Christ, every day, not just on prophecy nights, every day, is the only thing that keeps me standing. In preparation for that day of appearing before Christ, whether it's by our death or whether it's by our being alive and caught up with him on the day of Christ, we should seek to become readied for the greatest sight of the loveliest person you've ever known. Let's pray. Father, your son, the wonderful, beautiful, Beloved, not just yours, but our beloved. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, like a mighty ocean that has washed over us. And we love the sight of his appearing. We pledge to remind ourselves of the joy that is set before us, especially the one that is so much better. We ask that your spirit and the prayers of our fellow believers will encourage us to do that every day this week. This we pray for one another and, and this we ask you to do in us. Make us a people of hope, a people of prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen.